All right. Um, let's go ahead and open a word of prayer and time to God's word. Um, Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you for the Nicholsons. We just would lift them up before you. Um, thank you so much for their uh, ministry there in Mississippi and the um, access you've allowed them to have. I just would pray that you would continue to uh, continue to bless them. Um, I just would pray um, as we dive into your word this morning um, that you would just uh, make it clear to us. I pray you'd be with me to to say the word you'd uh, want me to say. I pray that you'd be with those that hear, that you would um, just uh, illuminate the truth of, of Scripture to their hearts and um, help them um, in applying it, help us all in, in applying it. And we just do pray these things uh, in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, if you watch much football... Um, the announcers will almost always give you some some keys to the game. There's, uh, you know, got to watch out for this quarterback. He's really good. Or, you know, be prepared for them to run run this play. Um, it's really, you know, you know, most of the time it's a lot of worthless advice. But there, there's this idea. There's keys to the keys to the game of what you want to do. Um, if you don't watch sports, I've got that too. Uh, recently. Recently, I checked out um, Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking just to read through it. I know that's maybe kind of a weird thing, but the same concept is followed, right? You know, make sure your ingredients are prepared before you follow this step. Make sure that this, you know, make sure that this stuff happens. There's certain keys or things to focus on um, as you um, as you are participating in this activity. So um, I want to look at some things um, in our Christian life to focus on. Um, and so we're going to do that in the book of Jude. So if you could turn with me there. Um, we're going to be mostly looking um, at Jude uh, verses 20 through 25. Um, that's, um, that is uh, the focus, but we, we do also want to get a sense of where we're at. Um, so the book of Jude um, is primarily primarily written um, to uh, to believers who were needing to contend for their faith. And we'll see that in verse three. There were, there were people that were creeping into the church um, and had a lot of false doctrine um, that they were spreading, a lot of uh, a lot of bad ideas, a lot of bad morality. Um, and so, We'll read um, verses one through three just so uh, so we can get a, a sense. Or we'll go one through four so we can get a sense of who these people are. So verses Jude verses one through four, it says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace mm -hmm. and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's just get a background of, of the book that we're dealing with before we dive into the verses. So this man, Jude, um, Judas would be, the, would be the Greek, but we, for obvious reasons, don't like to translate that name Judas. Um, he is, um, as far as we can tell, the half brother of Jesus, um, much like James, the person who wrote the book of James is, um, you'll notice that neither of them, neither of them mentions that. Um, and so there's a certain element of, of humility here as, okay, as Jude is side. talking to the believers, you'll notice the thing he oh. leads with is not, you know, his status, who he is. He go. leads with, he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ, um, associating um, himself with the believers, just like all of the, all of the people he's writing to are servants of Jesus Christ. He's just one of them. So he's writing to them. Um, you get the sense as a, a fellow believer. I'm concerned about these things as a, as a fellow believer. Um, you see, also mentions that he's the brother of James, um, perhaps, to lend some authority to, to the writing people, it seems we're a lot more familiar with who James was as opposed to Jude. And so there is a certain amount of, of, of authority that he wants to lend to his writing as well. Um, you'll notice in verse one, um, it uses this phrase, beloved in God, the father. And then in verse three, we see this, another use of the word beloved. And we'll also notice that um, in Jude, tw uh, in the primary verses we'll be reading, um, Jude emphasizing this idea of how precious uh, the saints were to him. 
Um, but then we see we see verse three would be kind of the key verse if you're looking for like what's what's the book of Jude about? And it's about contending earnestly for the faith. Um, and so with that in mind, we want to look at two foci. That's the plural of focuses or a focus. Um, the believers should have when they need to contend for their faith. And so um, verses three through basically 19 are dealing with what these people are saying. And I, I don't want to spend a, a lot of time focusing on that. Um, we kind of read verse four that talks about, you know, the extent of what we need to. They're ungodly people um, who want to turn the grace of God into you can do whatever you want. And they're denying the Lord Jesus. And that's um, there's there is more to learn there. And obviously the book of Jude was written for a reason. But I really want to focus on the response. So you're dealing you're dealing with these people. You need to contend for your faith. Jude in verses 20 through 25 narrows down his focus to, OK, I've talked about what these people are doing. Now, how do you as believers, how do you act? And so in verses 20 through 23, um, we're going to see that the first focus that we should have is the saints, um, is our fellow believers. Um, so we'll go ahead and read verses 20 through 23 and then um, dig into them a little bit more. Uh, starting in verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, aiding even the garment polluted by the flesh. So you'll see um, the first word, um, but what is that there for? Well, he's, like I've said, he's contrasting, right? He's talked about these um, ungodly men. He's talked about these, these people that are turning away from the Lord Jesus Christ and denying him. Um, but this, this, but you is now turning our focus, right? You can, you can think all you want about what, what, you know, these terrible people are doing, you know, how terrible life is. And in general, you can think of like, oh, these, these things are so terrible, but I, I love that Jude is now, he doesn't just leave it with like, oh, well, these people are pretty bad. There's now a focus. There's a, a thing that you can do in response to this, a, a, an action for you to take. And then again, you see, he says, but you beloved, Jude is emphasizing his, his care for the people of God. And we're going to, um, wow, two minutes in, I'm sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> his care for the people of God, you'll see it through, through the rest of the passage. Um, but, uh, you see, you see it in verse 17. And like I said, verses one and three, um, Jude was writing out of not a, a sense of like, oh, I need to maintain my my status as this this preacher, and if you guys follow these other people, then I'm not gonna, you know, I won't have any authority anymore. He's writing out of a genuine sense of of care for the people of God, um, and I, I don't think that that's um, you know an easily uh, imitatable thing. Um, but I, I just think it's so cool to see the stress that he pr places on his care for the people of God. Um, so then let's see what actions um, what actions these believers are supposed to take. First one, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Um, so if you, um, the first action is building. Um, if we turn over to 1 Peter, that's fairly close here. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, um, we'll get a, a little bit more of an idea of this this idea of building. Um, first Peter chapter two, and we'll look at verse four. This is um, Peter talking to some believers. Um, we'll read verses four and five. It says, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. This him, of course, referring to Jesus. Verse five, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through, through Jesus Christ. So um, you see this um, foundation stone is the Lord Jesus. Um, if you'll if you look in Jude um, in there in verse 20, it says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. We can, we can think of those as similar ideas. There's this 
this foundation that we have, our, our faith in the Lord Jesus, that all of us have believed as believers have. Um, but and there's this idea of being built up. But I, I like the idea in Jude of building yourselves up. There's this, um, the uh, ref, uh, reflexive verb, um, which is you as a group are doing this to yourself. Um, so there's, you know, we're, we're, we're being built up. But here, Jude is really emphasizing the idea of the believers as building, building one another up. Um, you have the, the foundation of your faith that all of us um, in this room uh, have in common, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are being um, built up on that. Um, when you think of building, or at least when I think of building, um, one of the key ideas from, well, as long as you're not in the city of Tulsa and road construction, you think of progress, right? Like we're actually getting somewhere. Um, again, unless unless we're building roads here, apparently. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes I, th I think of building and we, we don't think of this idea um, of making progress or, or maybe we just leave that to the side. But um, I guess just thinking about in your personal life, like what progress are you making spiritually? Um, and I guess not. There's an individual element and there's an element of that as a church as well. Like as a church, what what progress are we are we making? I, and there is a certain amount of like or an element to your Christian life of, you know, living your life, taking it day by day. But there should also be an element of, of progress of, you know, we've laid this foundation. You'll see, and if you go back to that second Peter passage, he talks about, you know, moving on from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. Um, are you finding yourself able to um, handle more difficult concepts um, when it comes to, to the word of God? Um, are you finding in your life that the fruit of the uh, the fruit of the spirit is more is more quickly and evidently displayed? Um, I, 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 I hope that you are. And I hope that you are not only in your own life, but that you're helping other believers to do that as well. Right. Like we're not like reacting, um, you know, negatively all of the time. And that's just, oh, well, I guess that's just how life is. There should be an element of progress. Um as uh, me and Lee have done foster care and are, are raising our own kids, uh, it's easy, especially especially with foster care, because you get kids that already should know things. It's easy to just snort. It was very easy for us to just snort, start out, maybe slow down, um, start out snapping at them and being being angry and and irritated when they didn't do things the right way. And then there is an element of, of progress, right? There's, OK, well. I'm, I'm very frustrated right now, but I need to take a break. And so you you kind of take a break and you come back to the situation. And then sometimes things don't bother you as much as they once did. And and there's an element of, of progress there. Um, and you definitely could see that with the kids as well, with Kristen and Gannon. There was, there was progress in their lives as they, you know, became more and more used to the way that things were and had a steady, a steady home. There was less frustration. There was less anger in their lives. Um, spiritually, that's how we should be, too. Um, there should be progress in, in the things that you find most challenging. It should start to become less of a, a less of a problem. And if it's not starting to become less of a problem, then that should be problematic. Um, I guess I just wanted to really emphasize that when we talk about building there, there's, we're, we're working towards a goal. We're working to be more like the Lord Jesus. And if that isn't happening, something needs to, something needs to change. Um, but Jude here is emphasizing the idea of, of us, uh, not, not just individually, but as a group, building, building one another up. Um, and it's hard to, uh, it, that's, that's a hard thing to do, but being able to see problems, uh, I don't want to like, I don't know, make it, make everybody be a busybody, but being able to say like, hey, I, we've missed you and we, we want to see you at church. And um, those sorts of things are, really, really contribute to the building up of the body. I, I know that if I don't show up on Wednesday night, I'm going to get a text from Seth Moffat and it's not going to be an aggressive text. It's not like, Hey, where were you at? It's like, Hey, we, Hey, we missed having you. Um, oh, was, was something going on? And it is absolutely phenomenal to get a check in and, and it's never been for like, Oh, we don't want to come to church. There's always been something going on. Um, and it is, it is just so relieving to know that, well, one, there's somebody that cares, but two, like we're missed. They're like, that there's a there's a noticed absence when we're gone and that's that's just an encouragement to to be out to the meeting um 
it's that sort of thing that encourages, um, builds, builds each other up and um, helps us to, to come to the meetings, to participate, to do what we need to do. And um, there should be there should be more of that. Um, so anyways, that's that's building ourselves up. Um, it moves on, though. It talks about um, the last part of verse 20. It talks about praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, again, this is something that we can do um, as a body. We have a meeting. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but Wednesday nights, we come together to pray. Um, and it's obviously people can't come out for various reasons, and that's fine. And like we've said, great to share your requests so that the body can lift you up, right? It's one thing to lift up your own prayer requests, and that's a great thing to do, but sharing them with the believers so we all know what's what's going on so that we can all lift you up is great. And it helps us build one another up. If we know that something is, you know, problematic, uh, like you're having a problem and, and you need some help and we know about it, we can come help you. And that's great. Um, so there's this idea of, of praying in, in the Holy Spirit. Um, so not just, not just praying, but as we pray, um, the Holy Spirit is helping us to articulate those things and making it clear to us how we should pray, what we should pray, uh, what we should pray about. Um, you'll see this idea, um, in Ephesians six as well. I believe when it's talking about the armor of God, um, I'm not hundred percent on that, but Ephesians six eighteen. um, talks about praying in the Holy Spirit as well. It's not just um, coming and, you know, well, we got this list and I guess we better make it through the whole list. Um, well, it is good to pray for everything, but it it's good to be, to letting the, to let the Holy Spirit move as you pray and, and bring to your attention, you know, we really want to focus on this thing and we really want to, we really want to be in prayer about this. Um, as opposed to, you know, a rote prayer of just just saying these words because I have to or because I feel obligated to. Um, so we see that idea as well. That's another thing that can that can help build up the believers and another thing that we can we can focus on uh, with the saints together. Um, verse 21 moves on and says, keep yourselves um, in the love of God. So um, I, I, I like the way that Jude puts this. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Um, it's it's not like God is going to abandon you. There isn't this uh, this idea that um, you know it's a moving a moving target and you've got to you know roam around and find it. It's just stay there. You're you're in the love of God. God God cares for you and wa- and and wants what's best for you. And it's it's very easy. You just don't walk away from that. Um, and I, I I say that I guess partly in jest because. Clearly, it's not very easy for me or for lots of people. Um, but it, it, in, in a sense, it really is that simple, right? There, God wants to pour out his love on you and wants to wants to, you to see this love and just stay in it. Don't don't walk away. Um, I, I don't know that there's a, a, a lot, I guess, to say about that. But again, that's something that, that we can do we can do together and comes from building ourselves up from, from praying um, to watch out for, for other believers and, and help them to also stay uh, in the love of God, to not, to not stray away from him, um, to stay in that circle of his love and favor. It makes me think of um, John 15 talks about uh, abide in me and I in you. And in fact, let's, let's turn there and and look at it uh, just briefly. John chapter 15 um, kind of echoes um, these these same ideas. Um, John chapter fifteen, and uh, we'll read. I just want to read verse four. It says, "Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it by abides in the vine." so neither can you unless you abide in me. And then verse five, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, and so this, I guess this phrase, keep yourselves in the love of God can, um, especially when we look at kind of the next half, can maybe be confusing thinking like maybe I can uh, walk away from God's love and then it's just not there for me anymore. But 
you'll see this idea here in John 15 and um, in other places that we can depart from his love and not be in that um, that circle of fellowship and closeness with the Father uh, and, and with the Lord. Um, but we're not the the relationship isn't broken, just the fellowship can be. Um, and so I, I think that that's the idea that Jude is getting at here in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Don't let that that um, fellowship be broken. Um, so that's verse, verse uh, the first part of verse 21. So we have um, for our focus with the saints, we have building, praying, staying. And then it, we'll see um, in verse 20, uh, the second part of verse 21, we're to wait. Um, it says, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Um, so I, I think a lot of other translations just translate this word waiting as opposed to waiting anxiously. Or um, I think there's looking for as well in various other places. Um, unsurprisingly, I'm partial to the New American Standard here. Um, but... The, there's a reason for that. So if you look in, I think, I believe it's Luke 12, it's talking about, Jesus is talking about the way that we should look for his coming. And it's talking about um, the, the bridegroom's servants being prepared to look for him. I believe this is Luke 12, 36. Um, and they're, they're waiting anxiously. So right when he gets there, they can open the door. Uh, the second he's there, we can, uh, they, the bridegroom's servants can open the door and be ready to greet him. And, um, I like the kind of image, the um, detail and image that's put there um, to explain to us how we're to wait. It's not, um, I, I guess there, there's multiple ways, I guess, that you can wait, right? Like I can be sitting in the waiting room at the doctor's office and I'm probably not waiting anxiously. I'm probably just like, okay, let's speed this up. I, I'm, I'm sick of sitting here or whatever. I don't really care to see the doctor, but I just want to be done. Um, or there's, you know, the waiting that Elias does when he has to, to wait to eat his food with, you know, much whining and unhappiness. Um, I don't think that that is the, the waiting that we're talking about. Um, waiting anxiously, looking for it, being ready at any moment for the Lord to come back. Um, and this is this is kind of a tricky thing to do. And again, I think it depends on the previous things. If you're building yourselves up in uh, your most holy faith, if you're praying in the Holy Spirit, if you are keeping yourselves in the love of God, it's definitely a lot, a lot easier to be waiting anxiously for the return of the Lord Jesus. Um, for for multiple re for multiple reasons. One is there's no there's no fear in waiting for Him to come back and you to be doing the wrong thing, right? If you're um, actively committing sin you are not waiting anxiously for the Lord Jesus. I am extremely confident in saying that. Um, there's also the Bible promises um, persecution for those that, for those that love him. And if you're, if you're following him and experiencing this persecution, I, I think part of the goal of that persecution is to make you wait even more anxiously for the Lord Jesus. Um, so there's a lot of ways um, I guess to be to be doing this anxious to be doing this anxious waiting, but I I just love the idea of waiting anxiously for it. You're you're looking for it. The, any second it could be. Um, Mr. Miller last week said, what was it? "Oh yeah, the Lord Jesus could come back in 2024." And Leah turned to me and said, "He could still come back in 2023." And I love I, I actually I I love that. That was a great attitude um, to have, right? Like, oh, it, it, it could actually be today. Um, and, and spending your time, um, doing that. Um, I, I, I think I've mentioned this from the pulpit before, but I hate when people say, oh, they're too, I, and I haven't really heard anybody say this, but some like on the peripheries, oh, they're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. And that is, I just, what? Um, that doesn't make any sense. If you are, if you have the appropriate attitude of waiting anxiously for the mercy of your Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Um, I guarantee you, you're going to be a ton of earthly good. Um, if, if your attitude is right, it's not, again, it's not just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. You're working anxiously for people to know the Lord Jesus, as, as we'll see in the, in the next two verses, you're, you're working. There's not a, there's not an element of, oh, I'm waiting anxiously. So I can't be involved in any of these 
you know, these church ministries, you will be doing so much, so much good um, as you, as you wait for the Lord Jesus. Um, so if you ever hear anybody say that, um, please give them a rebuke. I'll maybe do a recording and you can just like play my voice rebuking them or something. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's step four. And then step five, um, the, these 22 and 23 are a little bit tricky, but, um, Sorry, step five, I put have mercy, which is, is two words. I, I kind of had one word, but in the Greek, it's one word. So we're just going to leave it at that. So step five is, is having mercy. Um, if you look at 22 and 23, um, you could, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's kind of a toss up, but it's it's hard to determine um, who is dude talking about here. Because uh, it says, and, uh, we'll read 22, uh, I'll read 22. It says, have mercy on some who are doubting. Um, uh, I, I guess initially when I read this passage, I thought that it was talking about, uh, about unbelievers in 22 and 23, um, talking about unbelievers. And, and as I read the passage and, and kind of looked through things, I'm, I'm less convinced that that's the case. Um, you are again, free to disagree with me and, and talk to me about it. That would be, that would be great. Um, but I, I started to become uh, in Bill McDonald kind of, uh, I was reading his commentary and he kind of um, had some good thoughts on this, that um, this has to do with apostates or people who are falling away in, in the midst of kind of falling away from their faith. It says, have mercy on some who are doubting. So, um, so when you interact with someone who is is falling away from the faith, there's kind of, it's it's tricky, right? Because there's this element of, of anger and sometimes some of these people who are very committed to their, you know, particular cult or whatever, like you're never going to convince them that like, no matter what you do, you could, uh, anyways, they're, they're, no matter what would happen, they're not, they're not going to be convinced. And so it's, it can be very frustrating to interact with them. And I don't think those are the people that you're supposed to have mercy on. Um, but there's other people who've just been tricked, right? Like they've just been um convinced by things that they shouldn't have been convinced by and it seems to me that those are kind of the people that we're talking about and i'm sure you you, you know of someone one that's like that that's kind of they're not you know seeking blinding their eyes as, as much as they possibly can and refusing to interact with the truth but they've just gotten led astray and, and that happens to people and and i think with those people um, it seems to be clear that we're supposed to have mercy on them. People, people who are experiencing doubts, um, are are not going to be convinced by you, like saying, like, "How dare you reject the word of God, you stupid idiot!" Um, I don't think anyone would be convinced by that, I suppose. But um, there's this element of of having mercy on them, being willing to interact with them with patience, with things that seem to you blindingly obvious in the word of God. Um, those things apparently aren't blindingly obvious and it is okay to, to take that with patience and with slowness walking through the word of God and taking it piece by piece. Okay. The word of God says this and, and let's, let's look at that. Let's really understand that truth before we move on to the next thing. Um, interacting with the, the, the students at, at youth group sometimes is, is a little tricky because uh, for me, it's very easy to get, um, too far advanced, I guess, or, or, or think like, oh, th these things are obvious, um, even though I've like grown up with grown up with this my whole life. And so um, I, I do. Drew gave us gave me a, a thing to walk through this year. And it's been very helpful because the first lesson was just about the Bible. OK, the Bible is the word of God. What does what does that mean? How do we understand that? OK, let's establish the Bible as God's authority before we move on to other stuff. OK, that is a great thing to do. Let's just take it piece by piece. Um, and so having mercy on those who are doubting, going, going slow, not, not having an attitude of like, you deserve hell or, or something like that, um, is, is the way to go. Then it moves on to other ways that we can inter, uh, interact with people. In verse 23, it says, it says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Um, so, there's a there's a different attitude, right? There, I, I would guess that here there is a place for a proper rebuke, and this is again this is going to be led by the Spirit of God in your interactions with people. Um, but this would be, you know, you are going the wrong way. You need to get out of there right now. Um, 
they, you notice they don't they don't say have mercy. They say save others, snatching them, get them get them away from there right away. Don't let them be interacting with this false doctrine. Don't don't allow that. Get get them out of that situation. Um, and so there seems to be kind of a different a different attitude there, right? You're not um, you're not going slowly having mercy. It's it's time to get you out of the burning building, right? Um, so that's an attitude that we can have. And then here it's a little bit confused because the um, the King James and a few other translations don't have don't have this line. And on some have uh, I'll read the rest of the verse. It says, "And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh." Um, the King James doesn't have that line. On some have mercy with fear. It kind of lumps it in with snatching them out of the fire. So I'll let you decide what that you know what you want to think on that. But this idea of hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. Um, you'll see when um, the the woman with the issue of blood goes out to interact with Jesus. It's like, I don't even need to touch him. I just need to get close enough to him. Oh, the garment that's touching him. And, it, and she's healed. And in the same idea, the, the garment polluted by the flesh, you know, we're, we're having mercy and we're um, involved with, with these people to get them out of the terrible situation they're in. But you have to be careful that you don't be, fall for this sort of thing, that you aren't um, tempted to, oh, man, that sounds interesting. Let me really get into that or, or whatever. It, you, at the same time you're having mercy, there's an element of hatred for the sin that they're involved in um, uh, and of separation. And again, um, this is going to take the Spirit of God working in your life to know what level of interaction is too much is too little how are we going to interact with this person so that they um, hear the word of god but so that i'm not drawn into their sin um that's really hard and i am not going to say anything about it because i'm not the most qualified person to talk about that um but but there's a lot of prayer that goes into that as you're interacting with people how much do i do i interface with this person how much um am i how much is this person going to be benefited versus how much am i going to be dragged down um, into their sin. So that's that would be kind of the next part is just having having mercy on people in, in 22 through 23. There's different different ways that we can interact with them depending on on the spirit of God. Um, so just to, just to kind of hammer this this home of like working together as a group, building ourselves up. Um, I was looking up the second law of thermodynamics as one does when preparing for a message. Um, but the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, there's it, it, it has to do primarily with heat. But the the gen, kind of generalized thing is things tend to disorder and they don't tend towards order. If you put a pieces of a watch in a box and shake it up, you are not going to get a watch. Um, I think. No. Um, in the same way, our spiritual lives are like that. It it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes a lot of effort. It can be it can be daunting sometimes to be working and working and working at something. You're like, why why have I not made any progress? Um, well, you, you are. You're. You, it's just ta it's taking a while, right? It takes a lot of effort to get sometimes to get a a small result, and and that can be um, discouraging. But that's what that's why we have other other believers. Um, the idea here is that it is going to take work even just to maintain the, the status that you are at, um, putting aside even growing, just to maintain the status you're at takes work. Um, and so we need to be willing to do that. Um, so then I wanted to um, look at these last two verses. Um, so the second focus that we can have um, as we are preparing to contend for our faith is, is God. Um, and so we're going to look at verse 24, the things that he, the things that he does. And then verse 25 will be uh, what he does, what he deserves. So let's go ahead and read those two verses. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our savior, who Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So verse 24, um, I, I think is probably my favorite verse in the Bible. That's the thing about preaching your last message. You can preach on the, whatever you want and nobody can tell you no. And it's great. Um, I, I, there's just so uh, like it's, it's hard to interact with this passage without being 
uh, in awe <laughs> of who God is. Let's look at the, the first phrase. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. I, I don't know about you, but I stumble a lot. <laughs> um, and it is, it is crazy to think sometimes when when you've sinned and and you you think that oh I don't know sometimes it's it's easy to stumble with something that you've stumbled with over and over again and think there's no hope I mean this is never going to improve and and that's not true Jesus God is able to keep you from some I mean it's it's amazing to think that that's possible sometimes right that that God is actually able to do that but it is um, and you can look in. In Romans chapter 6, and it talks about the theology of how that works, right, of, of living in the Spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, and, and really dives into the theology. And Jude just puts it in the simplest way that you possibly can. There is a person who is able to keep you from stumbling. And why wouldn't you just rest in that person? Um, I don't I don't have a lot of complex... Compl- I wanted to talk about this past, this phrase more because I think it's... It's one that's worth quite a bit of time, but there's not a lot to it, right? There's one person who's able to keep you stumbling. It's so simple, right? Um, that's the first part. And then it says, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Um, I just want to read in Revelation, so that that's just turning over a page. In Revelation chapter 1, this is, um, if you're familiar with this passage, this is John writing to, um, writing about Jesus. There's a description of Jesus in verses 12 through 16. And verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, me saying, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. John um, I think you can make a good argument with the person closest to the Lord Jesus. It, um, he uses the phrase the disciple whom Jesus loves, right? There's a there's a sense of, of intimacy and closeness um, that John had with the Lord Jesus. And yet, when he sees Jesus, he falls at his feet as a dead man. And then to contrast that with Jude, that I will be able, uh, well, I'll be able to stand, I'll be made to stand by God, is incredible to think about. This man who, I, I don't want to idolize him, but it was just very close to the Lord Jesus, um, falls at his feet as a dead man. Um, but I'll stand before him. And then there's two ways that I'll stand before him, right? Blameless and with great joy. Um, again, this idea of being blameless, like God's able to keep us from stumbling. We're, when I stand before him, I'm going to be blameless. Wow! <laughs> that's that's a lot, right? Um and then the idea of being presented um, with great joy, I think there's a lot sometimes made, and I, I don't want to diminish the, the aspect made of this, but like a lot made of like when we go before the judgment seat of Christ, like you don't want to have your works burned up before you, and, and there's an element of, of wanting to work for the Lord in that, um, and, and like the shame that we'll feel. But guess what? When you stand before him, regardless of all the rest of that stuff, as a believer in the Lord Jesus, you can experience great joy um, to be standing in his presence. Wow. Um, um, okay, so that's verse 24. This is what he, what he does for us. He's um, able to keep us from stumbling, He's going to make us stand before his presence. And then verse 25, it says, The only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Um, I just want to look at these um, things that are ascribed to, to God. So this is Jude ascribing glory. Majesty, dominion, and authority. Um, so glory and glory and majesty are kind of two hard, hard concepts to, uh, at least for me, to wrap my mind around. The the glory, uh, I th- I think the best way to think about that 
looking kind of looking at other scriptures and, and the general idea of what glory is is um kind of what makes him look best um or, or, or the best side of a person um is is one way that's that's used to describe um i have a hard time really interacting with that word and understanding it in the fullest sense but but that would be one way of thinking about it that there's this um just sense of of greatness uh, about this person um majesty this word majesty is only used two other times both of them in hebrews talking about jesus sitting at the right hand of the majesty uh, on high um and it's derived from uh from a word that means great um so again you can think of this as as, as greatness um before before him dominion um well, let me make sure, because I study these birds in reverse order. Dominion is the idea of just strength, the might to do something. Can God do whatever he wants to? Yes, he can. He has the might. He has the power um, to do that thing. And then authority is, is a word. It's translated in other places, uh, right. Like you have the right to something. Um, authority is the same word. Like this is the, the sphere of influence that you control and you, it is your right to take care of these things. Um, and so these things are being ascribed to God. Um, and this just, um, gave me some time to think about, about worship. Um, and sometimes I have a hard time, uh, worshiping or thinking about worship, but what is, what is kind of the, I guess the point of worship. I, I was thinking of this yesterday. What's like, what's the point of our, of our worship before God? I mean, and there are lots of things and you guys can definitely add on to that, but at least part of it is just acknowledging um, you acknowledging to God that you think he deserves these things. Does God have majesty, glory, dominion, authority? Well, yes, he does. But, but part of the, of the purpose of worship is you acknowledging that um, before, as is going to happen in, uh, in mentioned in Philippians 2, before, before every knee bows, you get the opportunity now to acknowledge, yes, God, you, you have the author- one, you have the authority in my life and you deserve the authority everywhere. Um, you have the strength. Um, it, it's interesting to read, um, not that you should do this, but reading sometimes the, the ways that people mock God, if you just interact with this sometimes online, um, you know, people think that they're going to come stand before God and like point out to him, you know, things that they think he's done wrong. Like they are actively in the middle of denying his authority to do what he wants with his creation. And you get the chance to, in a sense, combat that by acknowledging that's wrong. God, you do have the authority. Not only will you have the authority forever, but right now um, you have the authority. You you have it in my life. You have it um, in in the world um, to acknowledge that, God, yes, you do have the, the strength, the might. Um, to be able to do that in an individual sense is a privilege. And, and I think is one of the purposes of worship of, of turning our hearts to the, to the Lord Jesus now um, while we have a chance to. And then we get to do that as a group, right? We get to, as a group, come and, and sing songs of worship. Um, and and sometimes I think about, like, well, what should the attitude of, of my heart be? Um, or, like, what should I be thinking about? Um, and I think one thing that's worthwhile is, is again, to acknowledge these these truths about God um, that aren't acknowledged everywhere. Um, and you, you get the opportunity um, to do that now. Um we're uh sorry i'm i'm about to start a new job um and i'm feeling pretty uh, even during the interviews i felt pretty underqualified to do it i this isn't my it's not what i got my undergraduate in and and even though i've kind of had my graduate degree in this i I still feel like i'm not i'm not ready i'm sure a lot of you guys have that have that experience um of something in your lives you feel underqualified or unprepared to handle um and and I think we frequently, or I, I frequently feel that way before the Lord, um, and it is it's fantastic to reflect on on verse twenty four here, and and the way that in a sense it doesn't matter how underqualified or how unprepared you feel, um, there's a God that's able to keep you from stumbling, um, and there's a God that's that's worthy of praise. Um, so just to wrap up, Book of Jude talking about contending for the faith. There's there's people that have crept in and and are trying to corrupt what's going on. Um, and Jude narrows our focus down in the last five verses, six verses, sorry. 
in the last six verses to two things, the saints and God, and the ways that we can, the ways that we can praise God for what he's done and the things we can do um, to build up the believers. So let's go ahead and close a little bit. Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you so much um, for this time we can spend studying your word. We thank you so much um, for who you are. And um, we would just acknowledge that you are worthy um, of glory, majesty, dominion, and authority the same way that Jude did um, all those years ago. Um, we just would um, pray for, for us uh, that you would help us to uh, build one another up, that we would be um, praying, that we would be waiting for the Lord Jesus to come back, that we would be um, just wor working for you. Um, and we just ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.